Thank you all. Oh my gosh, you guys. Um, so I'm grateful. I Earlier, Lucy called me Father Mike Spitzer. Um, I wasn't going to mention it. I wasn't going to mention it. He's Father Robert Spitzer is great. He's awesome. So I'm honored. Also, but then I thought, actually, I don't think she's wrong because after a meal, typically, the front row is the dangerous spot. We all know this, right? Kind of that sense of like just coming out. Okay, so a couple things. We were just taking running the gamut this morning. Of I thought like, yeah, we're gonna show up and we're just gonna consume. Like just you know, we're gonna eat some food, we're gonna hear some talks, and then on your way. What an incredible opportunity that y'all had to not just consume but to give. I think so often like we fall into the trap of we just become we might call it consumer Catholics. And that just since we just show up and like, hey, what do you have for me? What do you have for me? What do you have for me? And if it's not, I don't like what you're offering, then I'm like, ah, oh, whatever, move it on. As opposed to what we're really called to be, which is disciples. And it's amazing, this morning, um, not only did y'all get a chance to give, right, to be a disciple, but also you, none of you seemed surprised by it. <laughs> I, I think it's pretty remarkable, right? There's sometimes there's that sense of, um, no, uh, why do you keep talking about money? And I think we heard enough this morning that, like, the reason why is because there's a need. And so I just, that's awesome. Um, also, uh, Father Angela, I don't know math at all. I, I just, I wasn't even trying. He's like, he could, he could ask, what's 20% of 100? I'm like, I don't care. I don't, I don't care. I don't, I don't know. What is that? I don't know. I don't care. I'm not even going to make an effort. Um, so... These are all the random thoughts I had sitting there this morning. I just want to catch you. This isn't even the talk yet. I, because this morning, what I wanted to talk about is, is it's just kind of a, re, it's a reshifting of, man, we have everything we have to education, to, to giving, to opportunities. Uh, we're, I want to talk about work this morning. <laughs> and uh, in fact, when, when I was invited here, I just was like, yeah, absolutely, yes. Um, but if there's a conference on, conference on business and ethics, I'm like, well, let's talk about a theology of work. Let's talk about like what what is our, our Catholic perspective when it comes to work. Um, and so I just want to set up that that space in order to kind of take this next step forward. If it's okay with y'all, I just like to say a prayer, just gonna reset our hearts and reset our minds and like, okay, God, how do you want us not only to see like we talked heard about Catholic education? How do you want us to see giving, but also God, how do you want us to see work? So let's take a moment right now in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Father in heaven, give you praise and glory. Thank you so much for bringing us here to this place. Thank you so much for bringing us to this moment. Lord God, you have made us for yourselves, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. You have made us for good. You've made us for each other, and you've made us for you. Lord, help us to do good, help us to love each other, and help us to worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so I had some, speaking of statistics, I, you know, Steve was saying some stats. Um, when it comes to work, this is some of the more recent numbers. I don't know how far they, back they go, but it, roughly speaking, here are Americans. Americans roughly spend about 90,000 hours of their lives at work, which is, if you think about it, that is half of your waking life. So 90,000 hours of your life Half of your life, half of my life will be spent working. And, and even, even when it comes to like this whole notion of like a 40 hour work week, which I'm looking on the room, and if I were to say 40 hour work week, you'd be like, I, it seems like this room would be like, ha ha, yeah. <laughs> That's called Monday to Tuesday. <laughs> but the recognition of, of that, actually, in the United States, I think it's something like 86% of men work vastly more than 40 hours a week, and 68% of women work vastly more than 40 hours a, work, a week, even though, even though this, is, this blew my mind when I found this out, that since 1950, the typical American worker is over 400% more productive now than they were then. And yet we're working more than ever. In fact, in, fact, um, in Japan, it's something like this, that in Japan every year there are 10,000 people who die from overwork. In Japan, 10,000 people, it actually, it happens so often, so regularly, 10,000 people a year in Japan die from overwork. They have a term for it, it's called Kuroshi, which, which is, blows my mind, but what blows my mind even more is, is this, is that the average American works 137 hours more per week, per year, than the average Japanese person. So let's pause and hold on that for a second. So in Japan, 10,000 people a year die from overwork. In the United States, the average American worker works 187 hours more 
poor year than the average Japanese worker. Which just is just insane. Considering that it seems like this might not even be an option. I mean, it might not even be a necessity for us. In fact, you probably know all the, all the stats that, um, or is it, that Americans work 260 hours more per year than those in the UK. Imagine, just, can you imagine that? Imagine having 260 hours of your life back. Um, the one that bombed me out really more than anything else is that the average American works 499 hours more per year than the average French worker, <laughs> which, which is, that's three weeks of 24-hour days. That what do they do? What do they do? Just eat baguettes and <laughs> sip on their cafe. I just like... No, no, that would be not. That wouldn't be bad if it wasn't for the fact that I, I, there's there's been some reports that they basically they asked Americans how much do you enjoy your work, and you know this, 10% of American workers say they're actively engaged by their work. That's it, 10% say they're actively engaged by their work. 60% say they're not engaged by their work, and 30% say they actively despise their work. <laughs> Again, this thing that we're going to spend over a half of our lives doing, only 10% of us are saying like, I actually even enjoy it, I'm engaged. I mean, not even I love it, I'm engaged by it. And so I think a lot of us, as, as a result of that, a lot of us, our perception of work is like, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a necessary evil. I mean, I can think a lot of times that's, that becomes our, our natural default position, is your life is a, or work is a necessary evil. But we, let's pause on this and ask the question, okay, is there such a thing as a Judeo-Christian, is there such a thing as a Catholic view of work, because here's the thing that we we spent the majority of our lives doing. Is there anything that God has told told us about work? Is there anything that the the scriptures have told us? Is there anything that the church has told us when it comes to work? In fact, there's a lot of things. I'm not, I'm gonna barely scra scra scratch scrape. I'm gonna barely touch. I'm moving on. In the beginning. What is God? So if you go back to some of the Greco-Roman myths, if you go back to the early Mesopotamian myths of God and creation, they have a, they have a theology of work. And the theology of work is this. The theology of work is that the gods uh, were, they just wanted to live for themselves. They didn't want to work. And so they created human beings because they needed slaves. That the, that the origin of human person in Greco-Roman myths and Mesopotamian, Mesopotamian myths is that human beings are made to be slaves. That, that the gods couldn't be bothered to work at all. In fact, work is so horrible that the gods would do everything they possibly could to avoid it. And that's why you exist. Just to be slaves. But let's go back to the beginning. Let's go back to the book of Genesis. And what does Genesis say? What, what does Genesis reveal? Not just about us, but what does Genesis reveal about God? The very first thing that Genesis reveals about God is that God is a what? God is a worker. Why? Because the very first words are in the beginning, God created. So the very, very first image we have of God, the very first picture of God, the very first thing God is, is that God reveals himself to be a worker. That work isn't something he passes off to someone else. Work is something that God not only does, not only enjoys doing, it's good. It's so good that when God creates human beings, he doesn't create human beings to be slaves. He creates human beings in his image and likeness. So quick, quick question, how many people here are made in God's image and likeness? A couple, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that means this, that means, that means if, if, if God is a worker and you're made in God's image and likeness, that means that you are made for work. Here's, here's the crazy thing, is that sometimes we see work as a curse. Again. 10% of us are engaged by it, 30% of us actively despise it, 60% tolerate it. We can see work, we can end up seeing work as a curse, and yet the first two chapters of Genesis, they reveal that actually we're made for work. In fact, what happens, God puts the man in the garden, and he puts him in the garden, and he tells him to, it, the two Hebrew words are abudah and shamar. He puts him in the, in the garden to cultivate and to care for the garden, to cultivate and to guard the garden. So the very, first, the very first thing God says to man is, okay, go to work. Cultivate this garden. Guard this garden. That you're made for labor. Human beings, we're made for work. In fact, we're not just made for labor. We're made for three things. In, in the beginning, we're made for three things. We're made for labor. We're made for leisure, right? God rests, invites us into rest. 
and we're made for love. One of the other commandments is be fruitful and multiply. And when God said that, he didn't mean to just grow orange trees and do times tables. <laughs> we're made for love. So the, the heart of human beings is we're made for these three things. You are made for labor, you're made for leisure, you're made for love. And I guess I would say it like this. And, and if the book of Genesis, if the Bible ended at chapter 2, then the Bible in a year podcast would get to January 2nd, and then you'd be done. <laughs> but also, this world would be a, a much different. Because, but we know that we know that we have to go from Genesis chapter 2 to Gen Genesis chapter 3. And then what happens in Genesis chapter 3? These three incredible gifts that God's given us, these three incredible things God has made us for, they get twisted. We still, we're still made for them. Here, all of us in this room, all of us in this world, we're made for labor, we're made for leisure, we're made for love, but it's become twisted in our lives. And so even like, look at, le look at leisure. What, <laughs> man, look at, look at leisure. <laughs> what a gift. And yet from the earliest moment in our lives, we don't want it. I'm sure all of you who are parents know what it's like to try to convince your child to do something that you would do at any moment of your day? Take a nap. <laughs> like, how stupid are kids? <laughs> Let's be honest, all the students, they students, they left. They're not here anymore. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Whoops. No, you're great. <laughs> but here's the thing, is you're no different. We're all the same. We are all the same. Why? Because leisure has been twisted, and so we fall into these two extremes. We either have the extreme. Here's, here's what we do as, as dumb adults, as dumb human beings, as twisted human beings. Leisure falls into one of two extremes. Either, okay, it's time to take a break. I can't stop. It's time to take a break. I can't stop. Either I can't stop working, or, okay, I'm, I'm going to stop working, but I'm going to start scrolling. Or I'm going to start binging. I'm going to start drinking. I'm going to start eating. And I can't stop. You're, we're made to enter into rest, but I, I can't. Or we collapse. That, that sense of just, I know nothing else to do. Poof, I can't move. Why? Well, because this great gift that we were made for, we don't know how to do it. Not only as kids, we don't know how to do it as adults. God says, enter into rest. No, I can't. I can't stop. Or I just collapse. Same thing with love. We're made for love. One of God's greatest gifts to us is love, and yet we've twisted it. And so either when it comes to this thing, you're, you're made, we're made to will the good of the other. Like we just heard one of the students say on, on the screen. We're made to will the good of the other, and yet what happens? We're either twisted into we're indifferent to the other, or we want to use the other. Again, we're made for love, and yet here's the distortion ver distorted version of this. I either ignore. I ignore the people around me. I ignore the people in front of me. Sometimes we even find ourselves ignoring the people that we promise to love forever. Sometimes we find ourselves being indifferent to people that were made to love them. Or we use them. We can lust after them. We can manipulate them. But this is how it's been distorted. So leisure's been distorted. It's still made for it, but we still have this distorted version. Love, we're still made for love. We have this distorted version of love. Labor has been distorted. We have this distorted version of work. And so how, how does work get distorted? Well, either... Okay, Work becomes toil, or work becomes everything. And we're going to talk about those two things this morning. Is it still morning? Yeah, talk about those two things this morning. <laughs> that either work is toil, or it's everything. And we know this in Genesis chapter 3, right? What happens, eat the apple, and the Lord God says, he, he says to the serpent, the serpent's cursed. Pause on this for a second. I don't know if you've ever reflected on this before. But if you know the story, I'm just kind of summarizing it. I'm not really quoting. But God only curses the serpent. He doesn't curse the man and the woman. He curses the serpent. But to the woman, he says, from now on, you'll have pain in childbirth. And also, the relationship between you and your husband will be distorted. It'll be twisted. It'll, it'll, be, it, it, it'll be broken. And to the man, he says, from now on, you'll work by the sweat of your brow. You'll work amongst the earth with thorns and thistles. You'll bring forth fruit from the earth. Now, those aren't actually curses. What God is doing in that moment is he's, he's, he's giving them a prescription. He's actually giving them the remedy. Because as a cost of this, right, Adam and Eve, they're, are, for parents, they're made for love, they're made for leisure, they're made for, for, for labor, but now it's twisted, and so what happens? From now on, from this moment on, every time 
we love, it involves sacrifice. And so to the woman, that's what he says. He says, you're, you're made for love, but here's what's going to happen. Is as you bring forth life into this world, the, per, the person, the one you'll love more than anything else in this world, it'll hurt. It'll cost you something. Because why? Because love always involves sacrifice. And to the man, and this is to all humanity, right? To the man, he says, okay, yeah, from now on, what you're going to do is you're going to wake up every morning and you're going to get into your crappy car and you're going to get into the crappy traffic on your crappy commute and get to your crappy cubicle and you're work all day and you're the job that only 10% of people are engaged with. And then you're gonna drive home, why? Because you're gonna to have to do this for your family. You're gonna to have to do this because why? In the course of this, in this process of this, you're gonna learn that love always involves sacrifice. So, so, so even what God is saying about this is, is not that this is the end, but it's that through this, through love, through leisure, through work, something is gonna change. Work is not a curse. Work is not a curse. It's actually, in some ways, the remedy, just like love is not a curse. In some ways, it's the remedy. Because it's entering into this, and yet, and yet our experience, what's our experience? It's the twisted version, where it's either toil or it's everything. So toil, what does that mean? Well, it means our two experiences of work is like this. Our experience of work is either it's fruitless or it's pointless. That's what, that's what toil means, that we experience work as fruitless or pointless. So the idea behind this is, okay, work is fruitless. I don't know if you've ever experienced this, probably have. We experience work where it's like, I'm doing everything I possibly can to, to move the needle, right? I'm doing everything I possibly can to try to make an impact. I'm doing everything I possibly can, and nothing's nothing works. N no, it doesn't matter. How often have people in their jobs, in their work? Now, pause on this for a second. I keep saying work and labor, jobs, as if the only work, as if the only labor, as if the only job is the kinds of jobs, labor, and work that we get paid for. Not, I invite all of us to not think of labor just as your job. I kind of use that interchangeably, but I mean, I mean any kind of labor. Amen? Okay, so, so just, you don't need a paycheck. I'm just saying work. So work is either fruitless or pointless. So I do everything I possibly can. No, this is one of those things where I... Uh, like talking to our students uh, on our, our campus, like they, they know all about this. They, they, because we realize this. We realize that sometimes there are, are things you can do and it just seems like it makes no difference. In fact, that's one of the deepest wounds that has hit the human person is the question, I'm doing all this, does it even matter? And this is the question that hits every single human heart. I'm putting everything I am into this, does it even matter? Why? Because it seems like it's fruitless. We talk to our students, you know, we have a lot of Bible studies on our campus. And to have a lot of Bible studies on your campus, you have to have a lot of rejections on your campus. Because we have these students who, man, they, they're talking to their friends, talking to their teammates, the classmates, and like, hey, would you come to this Bible study? Sure, what time is it? Two, uh, seven o'clock on Tuesday. Great, I'll be there. And then they're waiting, you know, crickets. 7.15, 7.30, they don't show up. And like, I've been working so hard, it seems like nothing's happening. Every one of us has had that experience of work being fruitless. I'm working so hard and it seems like nothing's happening. So one of our experiences of work as toil is it, is it does nothing. The other is it's pointless. It means nothing. Our experience of work is either fruitless, it does nothing, or it's pointless, it means nothing. I, I, I remember when I first heard the term busy work. I mean, we all know, we've all heard the term busy work. But like in, in elementary school, I went to a Catholic, a Catholic elementary school, go St. Francis. Um, I, never, I never even considered the work that my, that my teachers gave me as busy work. I just, I just assumed that, well, they know what they're doing. If I'm doing this work, it's, I must have to. And then I got to high school and college, and all these my friends around me are like, oh, this is just a bunch of busy work. And what is busy work other than... This is work that is completely, it, it, it means nothing. It is completely pointless. They're just giving this to us to keep us busy. And sometimes that's how our, our labor can feel. Not only is it fruitless, it's doing nothing, it's pointless, it means nothing. And yet, and yet there's something, something about this that I would say we need to examine more deeply. Is all we have Toil is all we have, work that is fruitless or seems fruitless and seems pointless. 
Or is there another kind of work? And I think there's more kind of work. Now, um, going back to relationships, we say it like this. There's a great book called Men, Women, and the Mystery of Love by Dr. Ted Sree. He's a, a, he's a great guy, works with Focus, works with the Augustine Institute, brilliant guy. In this book, he talks about different kinds of relationships. Three kinds, in fact. Four kinds, in fact. Um, and so, so the first kind of relationship you might say is toxic relationships. We all know what toxic relationships are. These are relationships that you should get out of. Or they need to be fixed. To carry on like this is not going to be good. There's some work like this, too. If there's a distortion of toxic relationships, there's such a thing as slavish work. There's some work that maybe you can carry it for a little bit, but if you can't fix it, you might need to leave. Human beings are not made for slavish work. Just like we're not made for toxic relationships. So just keep that in mind. There is, there is a, a point where we have to draw the line in relationships. There's a point we have to draw the line in labor. But Dr. Sweet goes on to talk about um, what he, he might call like useful friendships. We all know what useful friendships are. Useful friendships are you happen to be on the same team, you are in the same class, you're in the same study group. And so the reason why you're friends with that person is because it, it helps. It helps you both. We're on the same team, so we get along really well because we want to win the, the game. We're in the same study group, and we work together because we want to get the job done. Useful friendships are fine. They're good. There's, some, there's such a thing as useful work. This is just work that has to get done. I mean, I, I, have, I have a cousin. He works for the uh, sanitation department um, in the city of Victoria, Minnesota. And, and he always says this. He's like, yeah, he works in the sewers. He works in the sewers. He's like, everyone, he has this really raspy voice. I can't do his impression. But he's like, everyone thinks that like, my job is, isn't important until their toilet doesn't work. And then whose job is the most important job in town? He's like, my job. Like, you're right. It's right because, because there's, this, there's this truth that there are some jobs that just, we need them because they're useful. They do the thing we need them to do. And sometimes our jobs, we simply have them because they're useful jobs. They pay the bills. There's such a thing as a job that just pays the bills. And that's fine. But we need to name it. This is a job that simply pays the bills. I have a, I have a brother, or brother-in-law. Um, my brother-in-law, he, for a long time, he just did data entry at an insurance company. So he'd get, up, get to work every morning at like 8, work until 4 o'clock, have a half-hour lunch break, and all day he would just look at the form and then put it in the computer, look at the form, put it in the computer. Wouldn't talk to anybody. He loved that. He's an introvert. And I said, Tanner, what do you like about your job? He said, what I love about my job is at 401, I turn off the computer, and I don't have to think about that job once until the next morning at 8 a.m., it says because He says, I have this job because it's what enables me to spend time with my family and my friends. It's a useful job. That's one way to look at work, and it's not the wrong way. It's just a way. So there's toxic relationships and toxic work. There's useful relationships, useful. There's also a thing Dr. Sweet calls pleasant relationships. These are just like the people you have fun with. Why are you friends with that person? They're fun. We have a good time. And it's like, when you talk about deep things, like what? Scuba diving? Like, what do you... No. <laughs> and they're, they're not bad. They're just pleasant relationships. They're fun relationships. There is such a thing that's just pleasant work. For 10 summers, I worked as a camp counselor. Not because camp counselors are paid a lot of money. We, in fact, we, we did the math at one point, my fellow workers and I. Um, I think we made 22 cents per hour. And so if you're going <laughs> to... If you're going to be a camp counselor for your life, you need to be independently wealthy outside of the camp life. But there's that sense of just like, there's some jobs that you do because you just enjoy them. They're pleasant, it's pleasant work. And there's a, a fourth kind of relationships called virtuous friendships. Virtuous relationships. And these are the kinds of relationships, these kind of friendships that, that call you out of yourself. That, they, yeah, they can be pleasant. Yeah, they, they can be useful. But they're even more than this. They call you out of yourself and help you become that person. Why? Because, remember, they invite us into love, and love is willing the good of the other. They invite us even more and more fully into willing the good of the other. And there's something like that when it comes to work. There's virtuous work. You might call it human work. There's some social scientists who call it connected work. When they describe connected work, what they're talking about, again, is that work that, that has, has a depth of meaning to it. There's a, a, wor a work that kind of is, it connects us with others and connects us with ourselves. It's the kind of work that pulls us and carries us and calls us out of ourselves. In fact, there was a, um, there's a, a man who talked about this. He said that human work or truly connected work has three aspects to it. And the three aspects of this connected work is it has a meaningful goal. There is a purpose behind it. And that... Every person, every worker gets to make decisions that actually matter. 
And so the human work, for, for work to be that kind of, not just useful, not just pleasant, but like human work to its depth, it has a meaningful goal, there's a purpose behind it, and you, you feel like your decisions that you make in your work matter. So like an example, I'm sure that um, you've heard of, a, well, there's a meaningful goal. So, so uh, <laughs> you, know how, you know how people, if you, uh, if you went to college, you might have the experience where people from your college will call you up and say, hey, you remember how you gave us all that money for the diploma? We want more. <laughs> the, 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 you know, alumni relations, right? <laughs> that kind of sense of like, um, hey, you gave, paid us all this money, give us more money. So people have to do this, right? Current, typically current students are the ones who get on the phone and they call the alumni and say, hi, I'm Beth, I'm from the University of whatever, and I, I'm asking if... They found that if the people who make the calls, before they make the calls, they bring another student in, and that student tells them their story about how because of scholarships, because of donor support, because of alumni relations, that that's how they can be there on the campus. They found that if they just hear one person's story, the rate of success in giving goes up 170%. Why? Because I'm not just calling to, like, I'm calling Mr. and Mrs. Jones, I'm calling Mr. and Mrs. Carlson. Call it's because this phone call will help someone like that student be on this campus. This phone call is worth it, has a meaningful goal. So human work has a meaningful goal, also has a purpose behind it. I remember the story about this, uh, this hospital. I can't remember where the hospital is, here in the United States. But the, the hospital's mission, hospital, which is pretty obvious, it was um, we help sick people, but, <laughs> but it was a mission that was shared by everyone on staff. It wasn't merely shared by the administration or by the doctors and nurses everyone including the janitorial staff. Like, why do you work at this hospital? I work at this hospital because I care for sick people. And so the agreement was that here's the people doing janitorial services, that they, they, they do their job, they, they clean things up, they replenish things, all the things that normal janitorial services would do, but they also have an agreement, hey, if a doctor or nurse, some other medical staff needs your help to help a patient, you're, you're on call. And so oftentimes, in the middle of some kind of situation, the janitorial staff is not sitting on the wall. They're being called in because why? Because you're here. Why? Why are you here? I'm here to help sick people. And that, that bleeds into the rest. Like, why are you changing the toilet paper in this bathroom? Because I'm here to help sick people. Why are you cleaning this room up again? Because I'm here to help sick people. So if we can connect your work to this not only meaningful goal, but having a purpose behind it, it changes everything in the third example of being able to, they have been able to make decisions. You can, that here at work, you're not just a cog but you can actually make decisions that matter. I'm sure you've all heard the story of the Ritz-Carlton, at least back in the 80s and 90s. And Ritz-Carlton back in the 80s and 90s, what they did is they, the, the, the people who ran the whole, the whole show, they delegated, they said that every staff person was free to use up to $2,000 of discretionary income to help a customer, no questions asked. So you're at the counter. And I'm like, oh my gosh, my flight's canceled and it's gonna, you know, to rebook, it's gonna cost $500. I don't know what to do. That rather than just saying, oh gosh, that really stinks to be you. <laughs> that the person helping can say, cost $500, I can help you. To be, I mean, imagine, imagine being at a, at a workplace where you get to make decisions that you know this matters. Why? Because the people who I'm working for, working with, they trust me. The person I'm working with, I trust them. That kind of meaningful work is, is the kind of work that we're actually made for. But it's kind of, the, it's in some ways, the kind of work that we haven't been able to... It's not, it's not a given, we'll say it like that. It's not a given. Because I'm sure you've heard of a, a guy named Adam Smith. Adam Smith, the you know, father of modern economics. That Adam Smith, one of his kind of like overall arching like uh, philosophies of work was if you pay someone enough, you can get them to do whatever you want them to do. That's kind of one of these driving forces, is, is that human beings are motivated by money. And, one of the, and, and, and to a certain degree, that, that when you're desperate, yeah. But what he didn't factor in is that we're not made for money. We're made for meaning. We need money, but we're made for meaning. And what, what you, you, you find, I mean, how many times have you talked to your 
kids or your grandkids, and they're like, I don't want to take this job. It makes more money, but they, I'm not connected to the mission. And sometimes we can even make fun of millennials or Gen Z folks. They're like, okay, wow, you, need to, you, have to, you have to have a meaningful work. But like, actually, no, they're connected to something that's true for all of us, is that none of us are made for money. We're made for meaning. <laughs> we need money. So meaningful work is gonna be the kind of work that has meaning to it. That again, it calls us out of ourselves and reminds us of who we are. But here's the problem. It can remind us, but it can't tell us. Because this, this is the other distortion of work. The first distortion of work is that it's just toil, right? Drudgery, it's, it's fruitless and pointless. The other is that work is my everything. The work is my identity. In this, in this probably maybe, I don't, oh gosh, here, let me go on a limb here. I'm gonna guess that for this room, that's more the danger. I could be way wrong. But my guess is that the work y'all are doing, you're like, no, no, this is meaningful work. This is fruitful work, it makes a difference. The temptation, particularly if you are good at it, is work is my identity. And I'm, I'm, I'm talking to not just people who work out of the home, home, like out of the home, <laughs> but any stay-at-home moms, any stay-at-home dads, this is also your great pitfall as well. Because who are you? I'm a mom. I'm a dad. I'm defining myself by my work. I'm a CEO. I'm an entrepreneur. I, and I remember this was really, really made clear to me at one point. I was talking uh, <laughs> with, uh, so I, I, was, I was stationed, my, one of my first assignments in Minnesota was I was stationed up in Hibbing, Minnesota, which is not only the home of Bob Dylan and um, Kevin McHale, if you know who Kevin McHale is, but also me for a year and a half. Um, and <laughs> But at one point, I remember I was uh, talking to this man, and he had graduated high school like 30 years before this. And he's saying, oh, Father Mike, you know, it's so funny. Last night, I was out at wherever, downtown in Hibbing, and he said, I ran into a guy from my class. It's 30 years later. And he's like, he's like hey, Ken, it's Tom. I'm like, oh, Tom. He said, yeah, I was the goalie. And he was like, 30 years later, he's still saying, I was the goalie. It's one of the things I love about being on a college campus is because this is what happens. Like, we have a lot of high performers. Like, we have a lot of, we have a lot of students who are driven. We have a lot of uh, student athletes. And I love working with student athletes because I, 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 excellence is one of the things that we just, we always want to strive for. Excellence is something that we just always want to shoot for. And so working with student athletes as their freshman year and they're trying to go into the next level and their sophomore year, they're becoming leaders on their team, the junior year is incredible. But I love working, working with student athletes their senior year especially if their season ends during their senior year. Because here's the guys on the hockey team. And I mean, some of them go on to play pro, pro, so not them. But the guys who, who don't, and they just played their last game. And they got off the ice. And from that moment on, for the rest of their life, they will never ever again identify themselves as, I'm a hockey player. It's, I was a hockey player. It wasn't, I'm a basketball player. It's, I used to play basketball. It's not, I, I play, I'm a volleyball player. Like, no, 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 I used to play volleyball. And that, that transition, I love being there because, not because I like rubbing it in, like, ha, ha. Like, it's, it's because, like, I want to help you. I want to help you do this thing that every one of us will need to do at some point. How do you let go of this thing that you've loved so much and you've put so much of yourself into? It's become your identity. How do you... Let that go without losing yourself. Because this is what high performers do. High performers are the kind of people who end up falling into this twisted version of labor. Is labor gives me my identity. I was reading this book recently by Albert Brooks. I don't know if you've heard of Albert Brooks, but he has a couple really phenomenal books. Well, this book is called From Strength to Strength. And it's about the second half of a person's life. Like, what, what are you going to do that second half? And he said, he said, this is really hard for strivers. He said, because strivers, you get where you're at because you, you strive. You've striven. 
you strove to, and, <laughs> and he says, he, he pointed out two things that I thought was just like, oh my gosh, this is so fascinating. Number one is he said that when people were asked across the United States, what's old? What is old? And I invite you to answer in your head, answer like, what is old? Like, how old is old? How old will you be when you're like, I'm okay with them calling me old? The average American would say 80, which is interesting because that's roughly four to six years older than the average age of death. I'm 75, but I'm not yet old. <laughs> But that, that, sen that sense of like, how, what, what is that? Like, just wait a second. How much time do you think you have? The other thing that he, that he pointed out that was, was fascinating to me was the rate of decline. Like, question, again, in your head, when do you think decline sets in? When it comes to your work, when it comes to your labor? Albert Brooks points out, he says, actually, decline sets in your early 30s. And, and then he was like, okay, you, we know this is true for athletes. It's in their 20s. You have some ultra-endurance athletes that they, they're hitting their, their, their peak in, around the 30s in there. But he said, okay, yeah, that, that's for, like, you know, manual labor. That's for athletes. What about for, like, you know, thought workers? He said, yep, it's your 30s. <laughs> it's your 40s. And you think about that, like, wait, wait, that, that was, that was, that's, well, that was a while ago. <laughs> And one of the things that happens is he says, okay, because strivers think like, no, 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 I'm in my 40s, in my 50s, I'm just hitting my stride. If they keep doing this, they'll get work wrong because they'll get their identity wrong. It is true, he goes on to say, it is true that when it comes to invention, people begin to decline, even in thought works, people, to, people begin to decline in their 30s. But when it comes to synthesis, People continue to improve well through their 50s, 60s, and 70s. So think, just to consider, there's, there's, a, there's a pro here, there's a positive side. You're like, oh, well, my life's over. Not yet. <laughs> it's that idea of like the, the new stuff, the innovation, the, the, the new ideas, the invention, that that, yeah, that is a young person's game. But synthesis, be able to take complex ideas and bring them together, to be able to lead, to be able to teach, all of those things are an older person's game. When I say old, I don't mean 80. That's too old. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> when, I'm, when I say old, I mean, I mean like where, where you find yourself right now. So to be able to realize, okay, my life and my work doesn't give me my identity. My work is where I, isn't where I go to get told who I am. My work is where I bring who I am. And this is the, this is the in so many, so many ways, the secret of Christianity. Because in Christianity, what do we have? I mean, I imagine a number of you were baptized as infants. I mean, you're baptized, maybe if you weren't, that's what a blessing to be able to remember your own baptism. I'm incredible. If you're baptized as an infant, what happened? Before you could do anything, you were claimed. Jesus, before he began his public ministry, what happens? He goes to the Jordan River. He's baptized by John. And what does the father say? This is my son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Before Jesus does anything public ministry-wise, he's claimed. And the same thing is true for you. If you're baptized, before you do anything work-wise, before you do anything of importance, anything of meaning, anything of significance, you're claimed. And the Father's declared over you, you're my beloved child. I'm proud of you. It's one of the, it's one of the distortions we have, once again, is that we think that our mission or our work gives us our identity. Christianity turns that on its head and says, no, actually, the first thing is your relationship. You've been brought into a relationship with God the Father. That gives you your identity. That's one of the reasons why, if you've seen the movie Chariots of Fire, 
And I'm grateful that you're not college students because when I bring up to college students, they're like, the what, huh? I was like, you guys, it was the Academy Award winning picture of the year in 1980, for Pete's sake. They're like, really back in the 1900s? Yeah. <laughs> in that movie, there follows the story of two track athletes, right? Uh, there's Harold Abrams and there's Eric Little. And Harold Abrams, is, he's a 100 meter dash guy and he, and he is he's one of the best in the world. But before his big race in the Olympics, the 1924 Paris Olympics, before his, before his big race, he's talking to his coach in the movie, and he says, I'm afraid. He said, yeah, and his coach says, yeah, you might lose. He says, no, I'm not only afraid that I might lose. I'm afraid because what if I win? He says, I have 10 seconds to justify my existence. And even if I win, then what? I don't know if any of you followed the story of Michael Phelps, how he described his, after his first like, record-setting set of gold medals in the Olympics and how it was devastating for him. This happens virtually to every single Olympic athlete. They find themselves on the podium, getting everything they ever dreamed of and being the most miserable they've ever been in their entire lives. I'm not only afraid, what if I lose? What if I win? Because why? Because he was getting his identity from whether he won or whether he lost. Contrast that with Eric Little. Eric Little, you know that this, the movie Chariots of Fire is all about him. He was a Scottish, he was a Presbyterian Christian. He wanted to be a missionary and he actually knew that God had called him to be a missionary. And at one point there's this great, incredible scene in the movie where his sister is saying like, Eric, you, go to the missions. I know, you, you, aren't you, why are you wasting your time with this track thing? Go, just go to the mission, do the church thing. And Eric Little looks at his sister and he says, I know God has called me to the missions, but he's also made me fast. And when I run, I can feel his pleasure. This is the reason why Eric Little, he, he was number one in the world in the 100 meter dash. But as you probably know, that since they ran the heats on a Sunday and he's a Christian, he said, well, for me, running is my work. I'm not gonna work on Sunday. He's the original Chick-fil-A and he, he dropped, he dropped out of the 100 and ran the 400. Because why? Because he's like, no, because I don't get my identity from my work. I get my identity from my Lord. It's relationship first, then identity. And then I bring that identity into my work. It's not my work gives me my identity. And this has to be the case. Because if it's not, what happens when, when the work is done? If it's not, what happens... Not just if I lose or if I win. What happens when I have to put the game away? Then who are you? There was a, a man I know very well who, first person in his family to go to college, was in the Air Force and went off to medical school. Um, met and married his, his wife and they had a bunch of kids. Um, and he wasn't just going to be a doctor, he's going to be an orthopedic surgeon. He's going to be a surgeon, orthopedic surgeon. But also not just, not just be an orthopedic surgeon with a bunch of kids. He's going to be an orthopedic surgeon with a bunch of kids. And also he's going to run marathons and do triathlons and do cross country ski races and do all these, all these things. And in fact, it was one of those things like, I can't just be okay, I have to be amazing. And so that was it. I remember him being so excited about his retirement because retirement's coming and then I'm just going to train. Like, I don't, I don't mind, I can put the medical stuff down because after medical, I'm going to be that 87-year-old, you know, Iron Man. That's what, I, that's, what I, that's what I'm going to do. And then as he's getting closer and closer to retirement, there were a lot of back problems. You know, hunched over, doing your medical stuff your whole life. He had some back issues. Then he had some heart issues. And it became pretty clear pretty quickly that he wouldn't be able to spend the rest of his life training. And in the midst of that pain, he found that, you know, having a little shot of vodka would dull the pain. Having another shot would ease it even more. And he became addicted. Here's this man who had this incredible life. He had helped so many people with his entire life. He had, he had not only raised this family, he had loved his wife really well. He had done all these incredible things. But here, when they have to let go of being a doctor, let go of being the athletic one, let go of, being the, the, let go of doing the thing you thought you'd, would define you, he couldn't. Thanks be to God. I remember being part of an intervention with him. And it saved his life. 
But that could be any one of us. Where it's like, okay, life is asking me, or God is asking me to let this go. What do I do? Because if it's my identity, remember, the work's been twisted. It's either toil or it's everything. If it's my identity, who am I when I put it down? Here's the last two things. Question. If God were to show up, what kind of work would he choose to do? If you were to ask the Greeks that question, they'd say, oh, if, if, if one of the gods became one of us, they'd, become, uh, they'd be a, a philosopher. Because that's, that's kind of godlike. If you ask the Romans, uh, they'd say, well, he'd be, he'd be a statesman, politician. That's the highest kind of ideal. Question. When God did show up, when he did become one of us, what was his work? Carpenter, right, yeah. And so, so typically when we think of carpenter, we think of like, here's Jesus and Joseph's, you know, carpenter workshop, and they're like, you know, at the plane and the lake, like the song says, and, and there's this, this, that, that, that golden hour where the sun's coming in and the sawdust is just right, you know, and they're just like, oh, hey, pop, you got, I got made this table. Oh, son, you know. <laughs> that that might have been exactly what happened. That might have been exactly the picture. But you know that work, that word in the Gospels that describe that word we translate as carpenter is actually the Greek word tekton. And tekton can mean carpenter. Some of you might know this. It can mean carpenter. It can mean someone who works with wood and shapes and builds things. But tekton actually basically just means laborer. It can mean carpenter. It also can mean stonemason. It can also, actually, they have some archaeological digs. They're about three miles away from Nazareth, where Jesus grew up. There was a town that was being built at the same time as Jesus was being was alive when he was alive. And it's actually legitimate, it's it's real possibility that for the majority of Jesus' life, he wasn't necessarily just in a in a carpenter's workshop. He might have got up every morning with his dad Joseph and walked a couple miles to this work site, and all he did was carry rocks from here to there. It could actually be the case, the reality, that God, when he became one of us, that the work he did, his ministry, public ministry, three years. For 30 years, what he did was just haul rocks. Because God's a worker. And I think about that and I think, what does that mean? What does it mean if for the majority of his life, when God became one of us, all he did every single day was just haul rocks. What that means is there's no such thing as work that's beneath me. There's no such thing as work that's beneath you. There's, no, there's really no such thing as busy work. No such thing as busy work. Because the point isn't the work. The point even isn't, isn't even what gets done. The point is who you become in the course of that work. I've been on campus for 19 years. And in the course of those 19 years, I've seen amazing, amazing students with so much potential. There's been some duds. But other than that, like, <laughs> no, but there's just amazing, amazing students. And then when they graduate, it's like, I just can't wait for, to see what they'll do. Can't wait to see what, they, what, what they'll go on and do. But there's a couple of students who have reminded me that it's not what they'll go on to do, it's who they become. Two years ago, two and a half years ago, we had a student named Laura. And Laura was awesome. She's in Bible study. She led a Bible study. She was a teacher. And she graduated and moved down to the Twin Cities. And she taught in an elementary school. And she, I remember she'd call, she'd call and say, okay, Father, I'm trying to discern the next step. I might go into psychology. I might go into this other thing. I might, I'm like, great, like, let's just bounce off some ideas, do some mutual discernment. And it's just awesome because Laura is just one of those people that just amazing. Just she, she loved her family. She loved her friends. She loved life. And she just put her heart into her work. Knowing that, like, when I show up, my work doesn't tell me who I am. I bring myself to my work. That's where I pour myself out. That's not where I find myself. A couple summers ago, Laura had ran Grandma's Marathon. Then the next weekend, she climbed a mountain. 
Then the next weekend she went to a friend's wedding. And then on Tuesday of that week, she had a headache and they brought her to the hospital. And a week later, she had died. And it was remarkable because I was just like, okay, here she is, 24 years old. All the times I talked with her, I just read recently the last text message exchange we had. It was that sense of, okay, what am I going to do next? I mean, I'm praying about this. Like, what's God calling me to do here and there? Is he asking, asking me to leave teaching and, as I said, go on to this other thing? Most of us would look at Laura's life and say, that's a tragedy because she didn't get to do what she wanted to do. She didn't get to do all that she wanted to do. And I would say that to some degree, you're right. To some degree, you think, yes, it's a 24-year-old. To die that young would be a tragedy. At the same time, the whole point of life wasn't to do a certain amount of things. The whole point of life was to become a certain kind of person. And you don't need 80 years to become a certain kind of person. You don't need 50 years to become a certain kind of person. You don't need 25 years to become a certain kind of person. It took Laura 24. And this is the reality of, of life. Is like there's no such thing as work that's beneath us. Because why? Because every single thing, every single thing we do, every work that we have, yes, it, it's twisted. So we either see it as pointless or fruitless, or we see it as our identity, or we see it as an opportunity to give it to God. And say, God, in this work, help me become the person you want me to be. St. Paul said to the Colossians, he said, whatever you do, work at it with your whole heart as for the Lord. There's this movie, it was a play called The Man for All Seasons, about the life of St. Thomas More. And at one point, St. Thomas More has this guy, this guy's named Richard Rich. He comes at St. Thomas More because Thomas More is the Lord Chancellor of England. He's like number two in the whole kingdom. And he wants to get into politics. And so he thinks that if he gets close to St. Thomas More, then St. Thomas More will give him a, you know, a leg up. And Thomas looks at him and says, Richard, I think you could be a teacher. He says, you might even you might be a good one. You, you could even be a great one. And Thomas More looks at him and says, a teacher? <laughs> if I did, who would even know it? And Thomas More looks at him and says, well, you would. Your family would. Your students would. God would. That's not a bad audience. Our experience of work is, is work's been twisted. It's toil or it's everything. It's fruitless, it's pointless, or it's our identity. And yet work is a gift from God. Work then also gets to be the gift we give back to God. Know this. Today, whatever it is, whatever your task is, today, whatever it is, whatever work God calls calling you to do, this gets to be the gift we give back to God. It's not about audience. Thank you.